This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. The Four Million by O. Henry. Chapter 25. The Brief Debut of Tildy. If you do not know Bogle's Chop House and Family Restaurant, it is your loss. For if you are one of the fortunate ones who dine expensively, you should be interested to know how the other half consumes provisions. And if you belong to the half to whom waiters' checks are things of moment, you should know Bogle's, for there you will get your money's worth, in quantity at least. Bogle's is situated in that highway of bourgeoisie, that boulevard of Brown, Jones, and Robinson, 8th Avenue. There are two rows of tables in the room, six in each row. On each table is a caster stand, containing cruets of condiments and seasons. From the pepper cruet you may shake a cloud of something tasteless and melancholy, like volcanic dust. From the salt cruet you may expect nothing, though a man should extract a sanguinary stream from the pallid turnip, yet will his prowess be balked when he comes to rest salt from Bogle's cruets. Also upon each table stands the counterfeit of that benign sauce made from the recipe of a nobleman in India. At the cashier's desk sits Bogle, cold, sordid, slow, smoldering, and takes your money. Behind a mountain of toothpicks he makes your change, files your check, and ejects at you, like a toad, a word about the weather. Beyond a corroboration of his meteorological statement, you would better not venture. You are not Bogle's friend. You are a fed, transient customer, and you and he may not meet again until the blowing of Gabriel's dinner horn. So take your change and go, to the devil if you like. There you have Bogle's sentiments." The needs of Bogle's customers were supplied by two waitresses and a voice. One of the waitresses was named Aileen. She was tall, beautiful, lively, gracious, and learned in persiflage. Her other name? There was no more necessity for another name at Bogle's than there was for finger bowls. The name of the other waitress was Tildy. Why do you suggest Matilda? Please listen this time. Tildy. Tildy. Tildy was dumpy, plain-faced, and too anxious to please, to please. Repeat the last clause to yourself once or twice, and make the acquaintance of the duplicate infinite. The voice at Bogle's was invisible. It came from the kitchen, and did not shine in the way of originality. It was a heathen voice, and contented itself with vain repetitions of exclamations emitted by the waitresses concerning food, Will it tire you to be told again that Aileen was beautiful? Had she donned a few hundred dollars' worth of clothes, and joined the Easter parade, and had you seen her, you would have hastened to say so yourself. The customers at Bogle's were her slaves. Six tables full she could wait upon at once. They who were in a hurry restrained their impatience for the joy of merely gazing upon her swiftly moving, graceful figure. They who had finished eating ate more that they might continue in the light of her smiles. Every man there, and they were mostly men, tried to make his impression upon her. Aileen could successfully exchange repartee against a dozen at once, and every smile that she sent forth lodged like pellets from a scattergun in as many hearts. And all this while she could be performing astounding feats with orders of pork and beans, pot roasts, ham and sausage and the wheats, and any quantity of things on the iron and in the pan, and straight up and on the side. With all this feasting and flirting and merry exchange of wit, Bogle's came mighty near being a salon, with Aileen for its Madame Recamier. If the transients were entranced by the fascinating Aileen, the regulars were her adorers. There was much rivalry among many of the steady customers. Aileen could have had an engagement every evening. At least twice a week someone took her to a theatre or to a dance. One stout gentleman whom she and Tildy had privately christened the Hog presented her with a turquoise ring. 
Another one, known as Freshy, who rode on the Traction Company's repair wagon, was going to give her a poodle as soon as his brother got the hauling contract in the ninth. And the man, who always ate spare ribs and spinach, and said he was a stockbroker, asked her to go to Parsifal with him. "'I don't know where this place is,' said Aileen, while talking it over with Tildy. "'But the wedding ring's got to be on before I put a stitch into a travelling dress. Ain't that right? Well, I guess.' But Tildy, in steaming, chattering, cabbage-scented bogles, there was almost a heart tragedy. Tildy, with the blunt nose, the hay-colored hair, the freckled skin, the bag-of-meal figure, had never had an admirer. Not a man followed her with his eyes when she went to and fro in the restaurant, save now and then when they glared with the beast hunger for food. None of them bantered her gaily to coquettish interchanges of wit, None of them loudly jollied her of mornings as they did Eileen, accusing her when the eggs were slow in coming of late hours in the company of envied swains. No one had ever given her a turquoise ring or invited her upon a voyage to mysterious distant Parsifal. Tildy was a good waitress, and the men tolerated her. They who sat at her table spoke to her briefly with quotations from the bill of fare, and then raised their voices in honeyed and otherwise flavoured accents, eloquently addressed to the fair Aileen. They writhed in their chairs to gaze around and over the impending form of Tildy, that Aileen's pultritude might season and make ambrosia of their bacon and eggs. And Tildy was content to be the unwooed drudge if Aileen could receive the flattery and the homage. The blunt nose was loyal to the short Grecian. She was Aileen's friend, and she was glad to see her rule hearts and wean the attention of men from smoking pot pie and lemon meringue. But deep below our freckles and hay-coloured hair, the unhandsomest of us dream of a prince or a princess, not vicarious, but coming to us alone. There was a morning when Aileen tripped into work with a slightly bruised eye, and Tildy's solicitude had almost enough to heal any optic. Fresh guy, explained Aileen, last night as I was going home at 23rd and 6th. Sashayed up, so he did, and made a break. I turned him down cold, and he made a sneak, but followed me down to 18th and tried his hot air again. Gee, but I slapped him with a good one side of the face. Then he give me that eye. Does it look real awful, Till? I should hate that Mr. Nicholson should see it when he comes in for his tea and toast at 10. Tildy listened to the adventure with breathless admiration. No man had ever tried to follow her. She was safe abroad at any hour of the twenty-four. What bliss it must have been to have had a man follow one and black one's eye for love. Among the customers at Bogle's was a young man named Cedars, who worked in a laundry office. Mr. Cedars was thin and had light hair and appeared to have been recently rough-dried and starched. He was too diffident to aspire to Aileen's notice, so he usually sat at one of Tildy's tables, where he devoted himself to silence and boiled weak fish. One day, when Mr. Cedars came in to dinner, he had been drinking beer. There were only two or three customers in the restaurant. When Mr. Cedars had finished his weak fish, he got up, put his arm around Tildy's waist, kissed her loudly and impudently, walked out upon the street, snapped his fingers in the direction of the laundry, and hied himself to play pennies in the slot machines at the amusement arcade. For a few moments Tildy stood petrified. Then she was aware of Eileen shaking at her an arch forefinger and saying, "'Why, Till, you naughty girl! Ain't you getting to be awful, Miss Sly Boots? First thing I know you'll be stealing some of my fellows. I must keep an eye on you, my lady.' Another thing dawned upon Tildy's recovering wits— in a moment she had advanced from a hopeless, lowly admirer to be an Eve's sister of the potent Aileen. She herself was now a man-charmer, a mark for Cupid, a Sabine who must be coy when the Romans were at their banquet boards. Men had performed for her a miraculous piece of one-day laundry work. He had taken the sackcloth of her uncomeliness and washed, dried, starched, and ironed it, and returned it to her sheer embroidered lawn, the robe of Venus herself. The freckles on Tildy's cheeks merged into a rosy flush. Now both Circe and Psyche peeped from her brightened eye. Not even Aileen herself had been publicly embraced and kissed in the restaurant. 
Tildy could not keep the delightful secret. When trade was slack, she went and stood at Bogle's desk. Her eyes were shining. She tried not to let her words sound proud and boastful. A gentleman insulted me today, she said. He hugged me around the waist and kissed me. That's so, said Bogle, cracking open his business armor. After this week, you get a dollar a week more. At the next regular meal, when Tildy set food before customers with whom she had acquaintance, she said to each of them modestly, as one whose merit needed no bolstering, A gentleman insulted me today in the restaurant. He put his arm around my waist and kissed me. The diners accepted the revelation in various ways, some incredulously, some with congratulations. Others turned upon her the stream of badinage that had hitherto been directed at Aileen alone, and Tildy's heart swelled in her bosom, for she saw at last the towers of romance rise above the horizon of the grey plain in which she had for so long travelled. For two days Mr. Cedars came not again. During that time Tildy established herself firmly as a woman to be wooed. She bought ribbons and arranged her hair like Aileen's, and tightened her waist two inches. She had a thrilling but delightful fear that Mr. Cedars would rush in suddenly and shoot her with a pistol. He must have loved her desperately, and impulsive lovers are always blindly jealous. Even Aileen had not been shot at with a pistol, and then Tildy rather hoped that he would not shoot at her, for she was always loyal to Aileen and did not want to overshadow her friend. At four o'clock on the afternoon of the third day, Mr. Cedars came in. There were no customers at the tables. At the back end of the restaurant, Tildy was refilling the mustard pots, and Aileen was quartering pies. Mr. Cedars walked back to where they stood. Tildy looked up and saw him, gasped, and pressed the mustard spoon against her heart. A red hair bow was in her hair. She wore Venus's Eighth Avenue badge, the blue bead necklace with the swinging silver symbolic heart. Mr. Cedars was flushed and embarrassed. He plunged one hand into his hip pocket and the other into a fresh pumpkin pie. "'Miss Tildy,' said he, "'I want to apologize for what I done the other evening. Tell you the truth, I was pretty well tanked up or I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't do no lady that away when I was sober. So I hope, Miss Tildy, you'll accept my apology and believe that I wouldn't have done it if I'd known what I was doing and hadn't have been drunk. With this handsome plea, Mr. Cedars backed away and departed, feeling that reparation had been made. But behind the convenient screen, Tildy had thrown herself flat upon a table among the butter chips and the coffee cups and was sobbing her heart out, out and back again to the grey plain wherein travel they with blunt noses and hay-coloured hair, from her knot she had torn the red hair-bow and cast it upon the floor. Cedars she despised utterly. She had but taken his kiss as that of a pioneer and prophetic prince, who might have set the clocks going and the pages to running in fairyland, but the kiss had been made maudlin and unmeant. The court had not stirred at the false alarm. She must forevermore remain the sleeping beauty. Yet all was not lost. Aileen's arm was around her, and Tildy's red hand groped among the butter chips till it found the warm clasp of her friends. "'Don't you fret till,' said Aileen, who did not understand entirely. "'That turnip-faced little clothespin of a cedar's ain't worth it. He ain't anything of a gentleman, or he wouldn't ever have apologized.'" End of The Brief Debut of Tildy